On now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 9894 in the name of Annabel Ewing on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill at stage one. I would invite all members who wish to contribute to this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Annabel Ewing to speak to and to move the motion. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am uh, very pleased to open this stage one debate on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. And I would like to start by expressing my thanks to all the members of the Justice Committee for their careful consideration of the bill thus far. And of course, also the very hardworking clerks on the Justice Committee and indeed to the many stakeholders that have uh, contributed to the proceedings. Above all, however, Presiding Officer, I would wish to express my sincere thanks to Sheriff Principal Taylor for his diligent and thorough review lasting over two years of the issues surrounding the expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland. Sheriff Principal Taylor was kind enough to give very comprehensive evidence to the committee in spite of ongoing health problems, and I'm sure we all wish him well. The context uh, of this review is that there has been a 41% decrease in civil litigation in Scotland since 2008-9. We know further to the review that the potential costs involved in civil court action can deter many people from pursuing legal action, even where they have a meritorious claim. Chair Principal Taylor commented when the bill was introduced, and I quote, the proposals address some concerns which may cause people not to exercise their legal rights and ultimately their right to go to court. He went on to say, and I quote, the fear of having to pay their own solicitor and also the legal costs of their opponents can be a significant deterrent. This bill provides for the setting of a straightforward formula in personal injury and other civil cases to enable a client to work out what his or her own lawyers can charge. It also removes the risk of having to pay their opponent's costs in personal injury cases, provided, of course, that they have acted properly. Those contemplating civil litigation need to have more certainty as to how they will be able to afford to exercise their rights. And the provisions contained in this bill will make the cost of civil litigation in Scotland more predictable and hence increase access to justice. The three major reforms proposed in the bill that will bring this about are the introduction of sliding caps on success fees, allowing solicitors to offer damages-based agreements and qualified one-way costs shifting. The first of these, the introduction of sliding caps on success fees, has been generally welcomed and when the time comes to provide the caps in regulations to be made under the bill, I can confirm that I am minded to set the levels at those suggested by Sheriff Principal Taylor in his report. That is, up to 20% uh, on the first £100,000, up to 10% on the next £400,000 and up to 2.5% on any amount over £500,000. The second major perform, uh, reform proposed will widen the availability of damages-based agreements by allowing solicitors to offer damages-based agreements directly. Currently, damages-based agreements are not enforceable by solicitors but are offered through claims management company, companies. They have proved very popular for those contemplating pursuing a claim as they are simple to understand. Basically, the client pays nothing up front but agrees to pay a percentage of the damages awarded or agreed to the provider of the legal services. The solicitor will be responsible for all outlays in personal injury actions, for example, including court fees. Chair Principal Taylor stated in his evidence that one solicitor-owned claims management company has entered into some 17,600 new damages-based agreements in the last three years and 23,800 in the last five years. This, he argued, would go some way to explaining the rise in the number of claims in Scotland over the last five years, about which some giving evidence to the committee have expressed concern. The government believes that the enforcement, however, of legal rights by individuals is rather something to encourage. And whilst on the subject of claims management companies, there has also been concern that the bill does not make express provision for their regulation. We have, however, been in discussions with the UK government over the extension to Scotland of the regulation of claims management companies by the Financial Conduct Authority, as proposed in the UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill. I am pleased to be able to say that appropriate amendments were accepted during the third reading uh, of uh, that bill in the House of Lords. Claims management companies will therefore be regulated in Scotland more quickly than would have been the case in terms of our initial approach, which would have involved uh, relying uh, exclusively on the work of the Esther Robertson Review of Legal Services Regulation. I cannot, however, at this stage give a definite date when the Westminster legislation will be implemented. 
The third major proposed reform is the introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting in personal injury cases. The vast majority of defenders in personal injury actions are well resourced and the majority of pursuers are of comparatively limited means. Although very few claimants are in fact pursued for expenses by successful defenders, there is always a risk to a pursuer that they may be liable for considerable expenses and possibly bankruptcy if they lose. Sheriff Principal Taylor's review confirmed that there is a, a real fear in the minds of potential pursuers which stops too many meritorious claims from getting off the ground. Qualified one we call shifting removes that risk so long as the pursuer and his or her legal team conduct the case appropriately. The test by which the benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting can be lost by pursuers due to their behaviour has been the subject of varying views from witnesses before the committee. Broadly, representatives of insurers have suggested that the bar is too high, while representatives of claimant groups have suggested that it is too low. We are therefore, uh, presiding officer, considering amendments at stage two to make it clearer that it is the Wednesbury test of reasonableness recommended by Sheriff Principal Taylor that is to be applied to determine whether the benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting may be lost. The bill also makes provision for the potential payment of expenses by third-party funders. That is intended to ensure that venture capitalists whose only interest in a case is commercial will be liable to adverse awards of expenses. There have been concerns that awards of expenses will be made against trade unions and providers of success fee agreements. That is not the government's intention. Trade unions do not have a financial interest in the proceedings, so they will not be subject to such awards as the bill is drafted. We will, however, consider amendments at stage two to make it clear that trade unions and providers of success fee agreements will not be liable for expenses. Chair Principal Taylor recommended that all funding of litigation should be disclosed and amendments will also be considered to broaden the requirement for disclosure. Part three of the bill relates to auditors of court who determine a successful party's expenses in litigation by order of the court or where there is a dispute with their opponent, a process referred to as taxation. The Scottish Civil Court Review, headed by the former Lord President, Lord Gill, expressed concern that the auditor of the Court of Session and the Sheriff Court auditors were able to make private profit out of a public office which provides a public service. The provisions in the bill will remedy that situation by providing that auditors will in future be employees of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Uh, those auditors of court who are currently self-employed will remain so until they retire if that is their wish. In future, however, auditors will be appointed under the same civil service rules which apply to the appointment of other officers of court. Auditors will continue to have functional independence as part of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and the auditing process will continue as it has in the past. As part of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, auditors will in future be independent of Scottish ministers in the same way as the rest of the Courts and Tribunal Service, which is an independent body corporate under the Judiciary and Court Scotland Act 2008. Provision for an annual report on the activities of court auditors will make the system of taxation of judicial accounts more transparent. <coughs> Finally, presiding officer, a word about group uh, proceedings. I am pleased that the proposal to introduce class actions to the Scottish courts has uh, broad support. I am convinced that the best way forward at this time is to juice, introduce an opt-in system, as it is prudent when introducing a new procedure in the Scottish courts to select the option which will be more straightforward to implement and which will therefore not cause undue delay in getting uh, the issue off the ground. Opt-in means that individuals must have explicitly chosen to be part of the group, having weighed up the benefits and possible disbenefits of doing so. This approach has been supported by an overwhelming majority of stakeholders, including the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society, uh, the SDUC, the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers and the Forum of Insurance Lawyers. We, of course, do not rule out considering an opt-out procedure at a later date once group proceedings have bedded in. In summary, the bill seeks to put in statute approximately half of Sheriff Principal Taylor's recommendations in his review. Some of his recommendations on uh, sanction for counsel have already been implemented in the Courts Reform Scotland Act 2014, while the remainder will be considered for potential rules of court by the Scottish Civil Justice Council. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, according to the Civil Justice Statistics for Scotland, there has been an overall and continuing decrease in civil litigation in Scotland of, as I said, not less than 41% since 2008-9.
This should be a source of concern for all of those who care about the provision of access to justice in Scotland and indeed the health of our Scots civil law jurisdiction. This bill will therefore implement the major recommendations made by Sheriff Principal Taylor in order to begin to address this situation by making the cost of going to court more affordable, more predictable and more equitable. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to speak, to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the Justice Committee in this Stage 1 debate on the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill and begin by thanking all those witnesses who provided evidence to the Committee. My thanks also to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for its report, which we endorsed. In particular, I pay tribute to the Justice Clerks who have done a superb job in producing the Stage 1 report on this technical and complicated bill, which will, by changing the rules on how they can find, fund their claim and the costs they could be liable to pay the other side, directly affect many thousands of people in Scotland who bring a civil claim. The bill's principal policy objective is to improve access to justice. The committee considered that despite conflicting evidence that on balance there are problems with access to justice in respect of civil litigation. However, it considers that more up-to-date research on consumer experience of legal services in Scotland is required to properly inform future policy. Turning now to the detailed aspects of the bill, it regulates success fee agreements, often known as no-win fee agreements, and allows solicitors in Scotland for the first time to enforce damage-based agreements where a solicitor will receive a percentage of the compensation awarded to their client if the case is won. One of the committee's key concerns was the approach the bill takes to damages for future loss in personal injury cases. This can, for example, cover lost earnings while an injured person is off work covering, recovering, or in more serious personal injury cases, damages may cover the loss of all future earnings as well as care and medical costs. The bill allows the solicitor to include damages for future loss when calculating their success fee, subject to certain conditions. Here the bill implements Sheriff Taylor's considered recommendations, but the committee remains concerned that failure to ring fence damages for future loss could reduce the money available to a person to pay for their future care and medical support. It therefore asks the Scottish Government to reconsider this approach. The bill also introduced qualified one-way cost shifting known as COXI. This means provided the pursuer has acted appropriately, they will not be liable for the defender's expenses if they lose their case. Witnesses had starkly opposing views on the introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting. Pursuer's representatives argued that COXIT is necessary to address the David and Goliath relationship between pursuers who tend to be individuals with little experience of the legal system and defenders who tend to be insurance bodies. Meanwhile, defender and insurance representatives argued that COXIX could have adverse unintended consequences and could facilitate a compensation culture in Scotland. The committee was persuaded that COXIX could improve access to justice for, for pursuers but considered that this must be balanced by other safeguards to prevent any rise in fraudulent claims. For example, by introducing pre-action protocols in certain cases to safeguard against fraudulent claims without adversely affecting access to justice. Crucially, the committee has asked the government to commit to post-legislative scrutiny of the bill. The regulation of claims management companies is a vital safeguard against the rise in fraudulent claims. In England and Wales, regulation was introduced in 2007, but there is no regulator for claims management companies in Scotland. Witnesses spoke about the negative impact the practices of some claims management companies were having on Scottish consumers, 
especially as a result of cold, call, cold calling, which Sheriff Principal Taylor stated was the biggest mischief of claims management companies. And research from which reveals Scottish cities suffer, suffer the highest number of nuisance calls in the UK. The UK Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, which strengthens the regime in England and Wales by transferring responsibility for regulation to the Financial Conduct Authority, FCA, was being considered at the same time as this bill. Following correspondence between the committee and the minister, the UK bill has been amended to extend regulation by the FCA to claims management companies in Scotland. Nonetheless, there remains a potential regulatory gap, regulatory gap um, which could have detrimental um, consequences for Scottish consumers if the civil litigation bill is implemented before such regulations are in place. Therefore, the committee recommends that the civil litigation bill should not be implemented until claims management companies in Scotland are regulated. Finally, the bill allows group proceedings or multi-party action, multi actions to be brought in Scotland for the first time. Whilst this is welcome to improve access to justice, the bill only allows group proceedings to be brought on an opt-out basis. Hence, a person must expressly consent to be part of the action. Whereas in an opt-out system, the court agrees the definition of those affected and anyone covered is deemed to consent to court action on their behalf unless they expressly opt out. The committee recognises the government's pragmatic reasons for stating or starting with a, an opt-out approach. However, given which is strong evidence on the benefits of an opt-out approach for low-value consumer claims, it considers there could be advantages in the court deciding on whether these proceedings are to be on an opt-in or opt-out basis. In conclusion, presiding officer, so far the minister has made no com commitment to post-legislative scrutiny, to commission more consumer research, to change policy on future damages and on coaxes and uninsured defenders, to delay the bill's implementation until the claims management companies are regulated and to amend the bill to ensure only regulated bodies can offer success fee arrangements. So whilst the committee unanimously agrees with the general principles of the bill, it asks the Scottish Government to give serious consideration to the above recommendations to ensure access to justice is improved and unintended consequences avoided. Thank you very much. I now call on Liam Kerr to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest at the outset as a practising litigation solicitor and as I hold current practising certificates with the law societies of both Scotland and England and Wales. I am uh, pleased to open for the Scottish Conservatives and speak in favour of the principles of the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. The Scottish Conservatives are committed to the principle of access to justice. Anything which ensures that those with rights are more able to avail themselves of those rights must be a good thing. In the 2013 Taylor Review, Sheriff Principal Taylor concluded there would often be a David and Goliath relationship which prejudiced the attractiveness and prospects of litigation for those with rights. He made 85 recommendations around funding civil litigation in Scotland and the bill seeks to introduce some of these. There are, however, a number of areas where we think the bill can be improved. Firstly, like the Justice Committee, I am concerned about the lack of ring fencing for future loss and consequent potential for award erosion. As drafted, compensation intended to pay for the care of a seriously injured litigant will be reduced by a cut going to the solicitor. This could lead to injured parties being undercompensated and not receiving the full value of the damages a court awards. These future losses, bear in mind, are an assessment of what might be required to pay for future care needs. And or it could lead to courts overcompensating claimants by increasing the damages award to negate that carve out or perhaps inflation to the statement of valuation of claim to offset the deduction. Many have expressed their concerns over this, including the Forum for Insurance Lawyers, 
who argued that, quote, to apply a crude percentage deduction from such huge sums could result in an enormous windfall for the solicitor and a funding gap and significant anxiety for the injured pursuer. I therefore agree with the Justice Committee's recommendation that the future lost part of any award should be ring-fenced, and notwithstanding the Scottish Government's response to the report, urge further consideration. The second area which merits further reflection is whether there are sufficient safeguards in place around quacks to prevent a rise in unmeritorious and or fraudulent claims. In Scotland, some evidence suggests that personal injury claims have risen significantly over the past seven years without quacks. Now, logically, removing the financial risk in raising a claim will result in a further increase as access to justice is increased. But by extension, there will be a rise in the number of fraudulent or unmeritorious claims. And it's my view that the bill as drafted doesn't sufficiently define the circumstances in which a pursuer will lose quacks protection. And therefore, we support Sheriff Principal Taylor and the Justice Committee's proposal that Section 8.4 make clear the benefit of quacks would be lost in fraudulent situations where the pursuer fails to beat a tender and where the pursuer's claim is summarily dismissed. Turning to claims management companies, I welcome the amendments to the Financial Guidance and Claims Bill, which will provide regulation of those in Scotland. This is a sensible move which will provide Scottish consumers with the same level of protection against nuisance calls as other parts of the UK. However, reasonable concern has been raised that if this bill comes into force before the UK-wide regulations, there will be a regulatory gap whereby there are no rules go governing the activities of claims management companies. Now, according to which, this could lead to more claims management companies registering in Scotland, leading to even more nuisance calls for Scottish consumers and leaving Scottish consumers open to harmful practices by rogue firms. And I hope that the Justice Committee's recommendation that this bill is not brought into force until the UK-wide regulation of claims management companies is in place is looked upon favourably at the next stage. And finally, I'm concerned at the lack of detail in the financial memorandum on the costs implications for public bodies, and in particular, the NHS. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde argued that a more comprehensive analysis of future costs is essential to quantify the financial impact. The Medical and Dental Defence Union of Scotland argue that quacks, if introduced, would mean that NHS resources will be taken up in defending unsuccessful claims rather than on delivery of services to patients. The purpose of the memorandum is to assess the financial implications for public bodies. It is surely possible to calculate the total number of claims made against public bodies and to then calculate the increased cost to the taxpayer if there is, for example, a 5 or a 10% uplift in claims. Like the Justice Committee, I urge the Scottish Government to undertake more detailed modelling on the likely impact of this bill. Presiding officer, the general principles of this bill are sound and I shall vote accordingly today. However, there are some flaws, and we hope that the government will reflect on this debate and bring forward appropriate amendments. Thank you. Thank you, and I call on Daniel Johnson to open on behalf of the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I begin, I'd like to draw members' uh, attention to the fact that my wife is a practising solicitor. Um, justice that is open for those who can afford it is not justice at all. A critical component of any justice system is the ability to seek redress against third parties who have harmed you or your interests. That is a fund fundamental point of the civil justice system, and we must ensure that it is available to as many people as possible. As Sheriff Principal Taylor put it, court action is always going to be stressful for litigants. Much of the fear is a fear of the unknown. Will I win my case, and if I don't, what will it cost me? The Taylor proposals represent a sensible way of increasing certainty and rebalancing the risks, particularly through qualified one-way cost shifting. <clears throat> the Civil Litigation Bill takes these proposals forward and has the potential to mark a significant improvement in the ability and confidence of individuals to seek justice. Labour will therefore be supporting the bill at stage one at decision time this evening. However, as it progresses, there are a number of issues that we'd like to see improved in particular, we feel that trade unions must be explicitly exempted from Section 10, that more could be done around the predictability and affordability of court fees, and that improvements may be possible with regard to group lit litigation. For many people pursuing a case involving their employment or workplace, seeking assistance from their trade union is the single most important step they will take. Trade unions provide support to the individual 
uh, and can help them meet financial costs. And the role of trade unions in this area is therefore uh, very complementary to the aims and objectives of the government in bringing forward this legislation. It is right that the bill seeks to ensure that speculative involvement by third parties is limited or excluded from these changes, but trade unions are not a corporate interest, and therefore this explicit exclusion in Section 10 is vital. And I welcome the Minister's comments in her opening remarks, but really I would like to see a, a firm commitment uh, and would welcome uh, such a commitment in her summation um, at the close of this debate. Currently, court fees are incurred and payable on an ongoing basis as a case proceeds. This pay-as-you-go model can prove to be an insurmountable barrier, even for those with a good chance of success, as they find this cash flow a hurdle that stops them bringing their complaint to court. One way to address this could be by making fees only payable at the end of litigation, and the government uh, could consider whether or not uh, they should be payable if successful, with fees being recovered from an unsuccessful defender. Provision for group proceedings on an opt-out basis uh, or an opt-in basis are welcome. However, further consideration should be given to adopting an opt-out model. The consumer group which contend that, such, uh, that given the often low value to individuals and in consumer claims and lack of awareness or knowledge about the claims uh, process, individuals may not choose to opt-in. The government should therefore clarify its thoughts on, on this area and, and give these proposals serious consideration. There are, however, two areas of very real concern, the financial memorandum and the provision for delegated powers. While nobody would wish for the, uh, uh, for, for the NHSC increased cost, this, the, uh, the, the, this parliament or any other public body, uh, uh, making it easier to pursue litigation clearly gives rise to the risk of increased court action being taken against the public sector. The financial memorandum must be improved to include actuarial projections and risk-based forecasting to assess the possible financial impact on the public purse. Of course. Ian Kerr. Thank you. I thank you for taking the intervention. I agree with the point just made, uh, incidentally. Uh, as an uh, extension of that, does the member recognise the evidence given in committee that the bill could increase insurance premiums uh, and agree that this is an unintended consequence that the government needs to reflect on before the next stage? Daniel Johnson. I think naturally uh, any action that would, could increase the, the volume of uh, civil litigation has that potential consequence. I was going to come on to in my remarks the fact that I think there needs to be post-legislative scrutiny on the impact and the, the, the general uh, environment. Um, but so I very much agree with the member on that point. Um, uh, indeed, uh, as I was just about to come on to, uh, the, the, the DPLR uh, committee uh, concluded in their report uh, that provision in section 7, subsection 4, could enable the government to amend part 1 of the bill and is in that re regard unusually wide. Parliament must protect its right to legislate and hold the executive to account and this section must be amended to ensure this. This legislation is welcome and we hope that it leads to greater access to justice but as I've just remarked it is vital that, uh, that, that Parliament reviews the impact of these changes as there may well be unintended consequences. For example, increasing, uh, creating an increased compensation culture or leading to increased uh, vexations or weak claims. Uh, for this reason, the government should commit to a review of the legislation within five years, uh, particularly of measures around uh, qualified one-way cost shifting and uh, the damages-based agreements. Uh, in conclusion, we support the aims and objectives of this bill and we will be voting for it, but do ask that the government consider our constructive comments so they can improve it as it progresses through Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to the open part of the debate. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Rona Mackay. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm supporting the general principles of the Civil Litigation Expenses Bill and Group Proceedings Scotland at stage one because the purpose of the bill which can seem quite complex and, and is hard to boil down into a four minute speech, is to increase access to justice. In my view, presiding officer, that can never be a bad thing. There's a need for civil lit litigation to be more accessible and affordable to everyone. How many times have we heard pe people being put off bringing an action because they say they can't afford it? There's been a decrease in civil litigation of 41% since 2008 uh, to nine. And in my view, and more importantly, Sheriff Principal Taylor's view, uh, this is based on a fear of the costs involved. Presiding officer, I'll out outline briefly what to me seem the most relevant points in this bill. I'm aware that other members will focus on one or two more specific issues. 
They are damage-based agreements, power to cap success fees, damages for future loss, qualified one-way cost shifting or COCs, and the regulation and claims of claims management systems and group proceedings. On damage-based agreements, the setup of a Law Society of Scotland working group will work to protect against conflicts of interest. It's vital that the pursuer is aware of the full range of funding options open to them. The bill includes the power to cap success fees, that is that clients are not required to pay two success fees from damages obtained. And I'm pleased that the government has committed to consider whether le legislation is required to ensure that caps would apply. On damages for future loss, much of the committee's evidence and questioning surrounded whether this should be ring-fenced when calculating solicitors' fees, particularly where someone has been injured so severely they require lifelong care. And as has been said, the committee is asking for this uh, provision. The bill introduces qualified one-way costs uh, shifting known as COCs for personal injury claims. Under COCs, a pursuer is not liable for the defender's expenses if they lose, but can still claim for their own expenses from the defender if they win. But we heard opposing views on the introduction of COCs. Those in support of the introduction argued that it's necessary to redress the David and Goliath relationship in personal injury cases where pursuers between pursuers who tend to be individuals with little or no experience of the legal system and defenders who tend to be insurance bodies. Those against the introduction of COCs argue that it could have unintended consequences and in particular could facilitate a compensation culture um, or fraudulent claims in Scotland. Presiding officer, I believe COCs will improve access to justice for pursuers, but the committee did hear concern over this. But I agree with Sheriff Taylor's oral evidence that this would not happen, principally because a solicitor would not take on a case that had little prospects of recovery, among other reasons. I'm pleased that the government will consider amending section 10 of the bill to protect third party funders, such as trade unions or public bodies, so they're not affected by the introduction of quarks. Presiding officer, we're all aware of the prominence of claims management companies and the negative impact of cold calling on customers. So I'm encouraged that the regulation of claims management companies will be introduced in Scotland. Apart from deterring nuisance calls, this will also discourage spurious court actions. This year, £125,000 was provided to fund call blocking to people identified as vulnerable. And the government agrees that the Law Society should make it clear to solicitors that a case referred by a claims management company is not a result of cold calling. The bill will also allow one set of court proceedings to be brought on behalf of two or more people with similar claims referred to as group proceedings, which the committee welcomed. And the bill would only allow group proceedings to be brought in on an opt-in basis where the pursuer must expressly consent to be part of the action. This, uh, this is opposed to an opt-out system where the court agrees a definition of those affected by the proceedings is simpler in the first instance for it to be an opt-in system. I'm sorry, uh, you must conclude. In conclusion, presiding officer, I believe the bill will facilitate access to justice and I'm happy to recommend the general principles to the chamber for that important reason. Thank you very much. Uh, the last uh, set of uh, the business programme overran, so we are on tight four minute speeches. Maurice Corrie, followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Corrie, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Ensuring that everyone has suitable access to justice is a principle that is vital to an open democracy and one that I and the Scottish Conservatives are deeply committed to maintaining. That is why I will be joining my Conservative colleagues in supporting the bill at stage one, but only on the understanding that the government will be bringing forward amendments during the committee stage to address the flaws that we are all aware of that exist in the bill in its current form. I think everyone does accept that the aims and objectives of this bill are well intentioned. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers have argued that, I quote, the fear of swinging expenses of wars and currently results in cases not being brought or routine under settlements in our jurisdiction, end quote, uh, is a concern. Unions in Scotland have similarly stated that the risk of being exposed to that legal bill is a real barrier to access to justice, even to members uh, supported by their trade union. And as was pointed out by Ronnie Conway of the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers, the number of personal injury claims in Scotland has increased in the past few years. However, he emphasised that it was from a very low base and that the rate of claims in Scotland per head of population remained well below that of England. This was a view shared by Sheriff Principal Taylor when he said that he had, and I quote, no doubt that the fear of adverse world of costs inhibits people from exercising their legal rights. 
And I think there is a general consensus as well that this bill has a potential to improve access to justice. In its written submission, the Law Society of Scotland stated that the bill had the potential to significantly increase access to justice. Nevertheless, improvements are going to have to be required to be made to ensure that the bill does not cause issues while resolving others. One potential issue that exists in the bill as currently drafted, of which I would be interested to hear from the Minister during her summing up, is a potential increase in insurance premiums for the Scottish people. If there is a large increase in court action because there is no financial risk of going to court, insurers will pick up the cost of more court cases, which will increase their overheads and I worry would lead to a price pressure on everyone's premiums in Scotland. Additionally, I would be interested to hear from the Minister about the th what thoughts she has given to ensuring that proper resourcing follows group proceedings due to them possibly requiring correspondingly, correspondingly greater judicial preparation time and consistent management by a nominated judge who deals with that particular proceeding. In particular, the increases in court delays which we have seen with only three courts, Portree, Lerick, Lochmaddy, managing to meet the 26 week target for 100% of cases in any month in 2017 is of particular note. And I believe that it would be of a comfort to us, to the professional person as well, working in the Scottish Court Service, to know that the government has started to think and plan for proper and effective resourcing. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, I do welcome the bill and its intentions, but I would like to hear from the Minister today on the issues I have raised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Mary Fee. Mr. McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I speak in this debate as a member of the Justice Committee, and I, like others, would like to put on record my thanks to those who provided evidence during the course of the scrutiny of this bill. I'm pleased that the Committee agreed to the general principles of the bill, and we have made some suggestions as to how that can be improved. The balance of evidence we heard suggested that there is an access to justice issue in Scotland, and this bill, carrying out Sheriff Principal Taylor's review, seeks to address that. Many people are put off pursuing legal action even when they have a genuine claim. As mentioned by the Minister, civil justice statistics in Scotland from 2015-16 demonstrate a decrease in civil law case initiated across the court of session of 41% from 2008-2009 figures, and we should all be worried about that. Many people will fear that they have to pay uh, to their solicitor and defender if, if indeed they lose, and I can't help but think that the current issues around austerity, welfare and other financial factors are also at play here. So on that basis, we do need this bill, and I'm glad that the, the committee has agreed to the principles. Now, like Rona Mackay, I want to concentrate on the bill introducing qualified one-way cost shifting for personal injury claims. And under this, the pursuer is not liable for the defender's legal expenses if they lose, but can still claim their expenses from the defender if they win. On balance, the committee is persuaded that the introduction of clocks could improve access to justice for pursuers, but notes concerns this could have unintended consequences uh, as mentioned by Daniel Johnson, for example, including a rise in unmeritorious and fraudulent claims. However, I think the arguments were for, for clocks were much stronger and included rectifying that David and Goliath situation, argued, for example, by the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers and, of course, referenced by Sheriff Principal Taylor. Uh, and Unison, um, of course, uh, during the committee session, said that it was a cornerstone of uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor's report. There were arguments against, uh, such as those by the Glasgow Bar Association, who legitimately suggested concerns about weak claims uh, because of a nothing-to-lose attitude. However, the main argument against, as I could tell, was that it would be a rise of spurious claims. However, we heard evidence from many who, um, who like Patrick Maguire of Thompson Solicitors and Paul Brown of the Legal Services Agency, just for example, argue that, that it would be unlikely to be a rise in such claims. The bill would actually protect against this, and the majority would indeed be genuine. And as a further safeguard, uh, as again, as Daniel Johnson mentioned, the committee has asked the government uh, to, to consider post-legislative scrutiny of the bill, uh, including clocks at the, the five-year uh, mark. The David and Goliath argument... Liam yeah, Kerr. Okay, yep. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I'll be very brief on, on that regard. Um, do you ex uh, therefore support the expansion of the test for fraud in Section 8.4, as Sheriff Principal Taylor uh, recommended? Fulton McGregor. Well, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to comment on that uh, at, at this stage, but uh, my point was around Quarks and the David and Goliath situation. Um, what I was going on to say was the David and Goliath argument really resonated with the committee. And I, and I note that the member also uh, resonated with that particular argument. I think we were all agreed on that situation. And it was good to have the committee all in agreement on that one issue. 
that you know we should be united in, in trying to restore uh, a balance to access to justice. Um, but what I was going on to say as well, what about the situations where David and Goliath wasn't a farm? Uh, I think it was referred to at one stage as David versus David. The Faculty of Advocates argued, uh, for example, that uh, quark should only be used, uh, only be available in claims against public bodies uh, and insured defenders. Uh, and the committee therefore asked the government to consider this as an option. But I do welcome the committee's response to this, uh, highlighting why they're not minded to change some of the reasons they gave that some defenders may choose to be insured, uh, not to be insured, sorry, when they should be, may take a larger excess than they should, or that they may breach the terms of their policy so that the insurance company will not act. So I do note those concerns, and I think that argument uh, for, for not being minded has been laid out well. And I will finish on that, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. McGregor. Call Mary Fee to be followed by Barry Goujon. Mr. Fee, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by thanking the Justice Committee and its clerks for the very informative Stage 1 report produced for the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill? And as a member of the committee during the evidence sessions and the drafting of this report, I heard from a wide range of voices supporting um, the bill. And I am now no longer a member of the, the committee, but can I take this opportunity to pass on my best wishes to the committee as they continue in their work? Scottish Labour welcomes this bill and its aim of improving access to justice. The Scottish Government's commitment to justice reform is commendable, and this bill shows their intent is honourable. The review by Sheriff Principal Taylor is also welcome, and the detailed review shows that the, the challenges facing Scots in accessing civil justice. During the committee sessions, there were conflicting views on whether there was a problem with access to justice, and I am glad that the majority opinion backed the position of Sheriff Principal Taylor and the Scottish Government and the Bill. There are, however, numerous areas where the Bill must be improved, as highlighted by the committee and by previous speakers. And it's been recognised by the Minister in the Government's response to the Stage 1 report. And the most not notable issue for me is in Section 10. And as a, a trade unionist, I deeply value the role played by unions in supporting members accessing justice. And I would like to see Section 10 amended in order to make it explicitly clear that the power to award expenses against third party funders does not apply to trade union funded litigation. And I do welcome the Minister's consideration of amending Section 10 as stated in the government response. And I am grateful for the Minister's comments on this issue in her opening comments today. However, I, I do think we need a very clear commitment that no trade union or trade union member will suffer any unintended consequence of this bill. And, presiding officer, redressing the imbalance that currently exists between individuals and large insurance firms is commendable, and the regulation of success fee arrangements is a step in the right direction to tilt justice back in favour of the individual. And the introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting, or quarks, will also help address the imbalance. And the committee has rightly raised concerns surrounding the possible unintended consequences, such as the rise in unmeritorious and fraudulent claims. And I do have sympathy with the Minister's position in her response to the, the committee's concerns. However, I do believe that the Scottish Government must be vigilant after the Act has come into force to ensure that the committee is not proved right and that pursuers are at a loss because of unmeritorious claims. And finally, presiding officer, I support the ambitions of the government in improving access to justice for all, and I hope that the concerns raised today and in the committee report are properly considered and that the right safeguards are there for pursuers and solicitors against conflicts of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this rate, we're making up time at an accelerated pace. Mary Goujon, don't take that as a license to go over your time. Mary Goujon, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I think it's fair to say that this is definitely one of the more complex matters that as a committee we've dealt with. And probably also fair to say that it's not really an issue which tends to pick up a lot of traction or interest either in the press or with some of the general public. I think sometimes you feel like you say civil litigation and people's eyes tend to glaze over. 
But, and that's unfortunate because this is something which is vitally important because it's about access to justice, it's about fairness, and the legislation we're looking at today could affect any one of us at any given time. And the one element that I'm going to focus on today, we've heard from others in the chamber already, is section eight and the proposed introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting or quocks for personal injury cases. Now, currently in Scotland, we follow the principle that expenses follow success, where the unsuccessful party in a case bears the legal costs of the successful party. Now, there are situations where that doesn't apply, such as when the unsuccessful party is in receipt of legal aid, has before the event insurance, or is supported by a trade union. However, that's not always the case. After the event insurance is another option which can be purchased by the pursuer before any significant legal costs are incurred. However, that's often prohibitively expensive and can cost as much as 60% of the actual cover sought. So people can therefore be prevented from bringing forward a claim because they're effectively being priced out of taking any action for fear of the legal expenses that they might incur. So it's because of that, along with the view that in personal injury cases, the, pursu the pursuer tends to be an individual versus a large organization or insurer, or the David versus Goliath scenario, that Sheriff Principal Taylor, in his review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland, argued for the introduction of quacks in relation to personal injury claims. And the introduction of quacks will essentially mean that there will be no risk to the pursuer in bringing forward a claim. Now, during our evidence sessions, we heard fears that this would result in a rise of spurious claims, though this was refuted by some, such as Thompson solicitors, who stated that it was quite simply not within their interest to take forward a claim which had little chance of success, or where the defender was an individual with therefore little chance of recovering expenses. And I had a particular concern, uh, for example, say if I as an individual could be taken to court by someone, the court finds in my favour, yet I'm still liable for the pursuer's legal fees. The Glasgow Bar Association had similar concerns and felt that Quox subverts the principle that expenses follow success. And as they put it, not every defender is a Goliath and not all defenders are insured or wish to rely on insurance. And Section 8 would protect even wealthy pursuers and prejudice even poor defenders. Rather than a blanket application of quacks, it was suggested by Simon Dorolo of the Faculty of Advocates and oral evidence to the committee that in order to create a balanced civil justice regime, quacks could be available only to somebody who's insured, a public authority, somebody who has the backing of the Motor Insurance Bureau, or somebody whose means and resources are such to enable them to make payment of expenses. However, all of these concerns weren't shared by Sheriff Principal Taylor in response to this issue at committee. And he said to us there, we can look to England and Wales where the rules of court are the same as what is proposed here to find out what has happened there. We've heard of no difficulties with qualified one ways cost shifting being operated as it is proposed to be operated here. So this system has been operating in England and Wales with no issues having been raised, as certainly as far as we as a committee are aware, which does make that the point that he raised hard to argue with. To draw that to a conclusion, again, the Civil Litigation Bill has been one of the most difficult pieces of work we've undertaken because of the very polarising views on each side of the issues raised. So finding a compromise to all of that was never going to be an easy task. And I really want to add my thanks to, to my other colleagues today, to all of those who took time to submit evidence to the committee and to the clerks for pulling all of that together. I think the introduction of quacks will be a positive step. Um, and I believe that this bill, if passed, will increase uh, access to justice know. for people in Scotland. Concludes. That's why I support the general principles thank of the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call John Finney to be followed by Ben McPherson. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. Uh, I took gratification from the convener saying early on there that it was technical and complicated and indeed we've heard that from others and it's also broadened the parliamentary vocabulary to quacks, which we've heard an excellent uh, uh, explanation of from, from Marie Goujon just prior to me there. I note in, and I'm great to all the people who continue to give us briefings, including the Law Society of Scotland who said in relation to quacks, the basic terms are good and will help provide certainty, which is the priority for solicitors. And I, I think we need to have a discussion too around what the purpose of our legal system is in the course of examining this we did. It is to serve our citizens. And we heard from the minister that was a reduction of 41% the level of litigation and clearly there are a lot of interest to be served not those of at least those of David and Goliath much mentioned in 
debate thus far. Uh, Patrick Maguire, representing uh, Thompson's solicitor, told the committee, and I quote here, I have absolutely no doubt that the provisions that are in the bill will enhance access to justice. Mm -hmm. Equally important, it will also do what Sheriff Principal Taylor said was his prime focus in what I see as the mischief of the bill, which is redressing the imbalance in the asymmetrical relationship between the pursuers of personal injury claims and the extremely large, powerful and wealthy insurers. So um, the Scottish Government made very clear in the, the principle uh, of this bill was creating a more accessible and affordable and equitable justice system. And um, at close of play, the we'll, Scottish Green Party will be supporting the uh, general principles of the bill. That's not to say there aren't uh, things that we would wish to see improve. The, in relation to court fees, again, um, Thompson's solicitors had a very clear view on that. Um, and they, they would uh, suggest that the court fees should be treated the same way as expenses are under Quark's provisions in the bill. And this would mean that pursuers' court fees would only be paid at the end of the case and then only when they could be recovered from an unsuccessful defender. Thus, the pursuer would always be protected from liability. If the case was not won, the defender would pay the pursuer's fees. If the case was lost, the pursuer would not have to pay court fees. Because money is at the, 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 the heart of a lot of what we did discuss, and in particular concern about issues around future loss uh, and the, the suggestion from the committee that that be ring fenced. That's a very personal thing. That's something that considers someone's future career prospects, their loss of earnings, their health uh, um, projections, and I, I, um, hopefully that will be uh, taken on board. Third-party funders, um, um, a number of my colleagues have mentioned these, and clearly we've heard the assurance from the Minister that this wasn't to include trade unions. I think that should be expressly uh, um, said. Um, welcome the issue of disclosure of, of funding and also in post-legislative scrutiny, that's very important too. I want to touch to something that the Minister won't be surprised I, I, I mention, as I seem to mention at every piece of civil legislation, and that is the Athos Convention. And the, the view... Um, uh, that uh, um, certainly access to environmental justice in Scotland urgently requires a comprehensive response. So um, it's, it's certainly the view of Friends of the Earth and others that the Parliament should extend qualified one-way cost shifting to environmental cases in order to ensure that bringing these cases is not prohibitively expensive. Because we do know that this is uh, not a uh, equality of arms that's applied thus far, and this goes some way to addressing that. But um, the criticism that's rightly been uh, directed uh, to uh, the Scottish legal system and its failure to comply with the Art House Convention, and it was a manifesto commitment of the, the previous government, and they did say they would consult on it, and in absolute fairness to them, four years, 50 weeks into uh, their five-year term, they did consult on it. So I hope that's something you'd take on, on, on board, Minister. But just to confirm again, the Scottish Green Party supports the general principles of the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ben McPherson, last speaker in the open debate. Mr McPherson, please. Thank you, President Officer. And, uh, first of all, I'd like to declare an interest as a previous practising solicitor, uh, still registered on the role of Scottish solicitors, though, of course, not practising. And uh, also to thank all my colleagues on the Justice Committee, all the witnesses that gave evidence, and the clerks for helping us uh, through, through the process to this point. I, I highly commend the, the Scottish Government for bringing forward the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill uh, in order to enhance access to justice through a number of means, as we've already heard, and also to undertake the constant evolution of our independent legal system in order to make sure it's keeping uh, in touch with uh, the needs of society and the, the, the development of our economy. As others have done, I would like to focus on a specific part of the bill, uh, in my case, part four, around group proceedings, which is the, came out of Principal Taylor's, uh, Chef Principal Taylor's uh, chapter 12 on multi-party actions. Uh, the, as it, the, the Scottish Government has, has put forward, the bringing forward of uh, group proceedings in Scotland will help to broaden access to justice by allowing multi-party multi litigants the opportunity to bring an action at a lower cost than individual cases, and it will also deliver a more streamlined and cost-effective outcome and reduce court time by enabling a number of related claims to be taken forward as one group procedure. This uh, has support from many stakeholders, uh, as the Scottish Government's response to our report says, the Scottish Law Commission uh, supported this in the, the 1990s, and it supported it uh, with the opt-in uh, procedure, which is 
what the bill in includes at present. And this was also supported in written evidence received in August from the Law Society of Scotland, where they said that the basic proposals for group action seem sensible and it should be able to work for solicitors in practice, a system which proceeds on the basis of opt-in rather than opt-out as a positive development and is welcomed by agents. However, this is something I appreciate as a, a point of contention, the difference between opt-out procedure and, and opt-in, and I listened attentively in committee from which is, uh, to which is evidence around the, the benefits of an, an opt-out procedure, and uh, also we received a, an interesting briefing from Friends of the Earth uh, Scotland about the, the value of an opt-out procedure. Uh, and I asked a number of questions uh, about this in committee. However, I, I am convinced at the moment around the practical nature of this is a new part of Scots law that's being introduced uh, and that needs to be an opportunity for the legal system to build up the experience of group proceedings and that an opt-in is better for introducing something entirely new to Scots law and the, the practical considerations around that. And the further consideration that I would like to highlight is that I think it's important that while this is reassuring, the, as the committee, and, and while the, the, the assurances around legal aid, which are noted in our recommendation 396 of our report, are assuring from the Scottish Government, I think there, there is a need to keep looking at this question. And I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government has committed to looking at this on an ongoing basis. Uh, the opt-in is better in order to not cause undue delay now, but I think as a Parliament, and as a society, we need to keep looking at the value of a, perhaps utilising an opt-out system in the future for group proceedings. So perhaps if there is a commitment to post-legislative scrutiny, as the convener of our committee suggested, then an evaluation on opt-out procedure could be undertaken then. I would also like to note one last point, convener, that, uh, presiding officer, that... Uh, the Law Society said in their briefing for this debate, which was that expenses in group actions, uh, the question of how issues of expenses in group actions will be dealt with has not been considered in the bill and we believe would be helpful to address. So I pose that point to the Thank government. you very much. Uh, thank you for a fleeting moment, Mr McPherson, I thought witches had given evidence, but I realised it was which that had given evidence. It was quite intriguing as a group action. Um, I now call Daniel Johnson to close for Labour at says five minutes. Mr Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and can I begin? I should have, at the beginning of my previous statement, also pointed out that I'm a, a trade union member, being a member of both Community of the Trade Union and USDA. Um, I think that it, it is uh, notable that the high degree of consensus that there's been in this afternoon's debate. I think there's a, a, a huge uh, common agreement that we must commit to these uh, uh, reforms, both in terms of their specifics, but also in terms of the general principles. I think Marie Goujon put it very well that quite often when we're discussing these matters, people's eyes glaze over and they wonder what on earth it means to them. But the reality is, is that when you need redress, when you need to use the courts, it all becomes all too real. And for too many people, both the cost of taking court action and indeed the complexity becomes prohibitive. And I think that's why the key measures that the government is bringing forward here will be helpful. And I think the, 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 there is broad agreement about that, agreement that the sliding caps, um, the, the, the uh, uh, introduction of GBAs for solicitors, uh, qualified one-way cost shifting and group proceedings, what these will do is improve transparency of what costs people are likely to face while pursuing uh, a court case, uh, removal of downside uncertainty providing more options for individuals um, in terms of getting access to legal services and also more routes for, uh, for justice in terms of the introduction of group proceedings. And I think these are all very welcome. Now, there's obviously been a lot of talk of quarks and, and David and Goliath, but this is obviously the, the central and key provision. I thought Fulton McGregor did an excellent job of outlining both the, uh, the, the advantages um, of uh, the introduction of quarks, but also the pitfalls. Clearly, the removal of uh, the, the awarding of costs to people pursuing a case does remove that very huge consideration that many people would contemplate. And I think that is clearly um, uh, of a considerable advantage. But it does also come with the possibility of some downsides. And I think Fulton McGregor uh, provided a very uh, balanced analysis of that. And I think that the government will need to watch 
of what, what may uh, happen uh, in, in terms of uh, reducing the threshold uh, of litigation. And indeed, I think the examples of David versus David uh, actions, I think, are ones that will need to be considered. Now, there were also three, I think, key concerns which I didn't cover in my opening remarks, but were well, well made through the debate. A number of members pointed out uh, the, the issue around uh, future losses. Now, clearly, one of the key reasons individuals might pursue court action is because they are uh, facing increased living costs or care costs because of uh, personal injury. It's really vital that, that those people are still able to achieve um, awards to enable them to support themselves. And I think any consequences of this bill which might lead them to finding it harder to achieve those costs, I think would be of serious concern. So I think that, that, that uh, ring fencing must be looked at. Likewise, a regulatory gap which might be introduced through this uh, bill going, passing into law needs to be looked at. It would be absurd if uh, claims management companies uh, descended upon Scotland because they found a, a loophole as we were actually uh, attempting to democratise the law. And again, I think those points were well made. And likewise, I think the points around the possibility or risks of in increased insurance premiums need to be uh, watched. Indeed, I think overall is the point that I, I, I raised in, in my opening remarks around cost to public sector. I think that the point around what might happen if there are increased volumes and value of claims needs to be looked at, whether that's insurance premiums or indeed cost to the public sector. Um, for those reasons, I think it is vital that the government does commit to a review. And I finally just remark upon John Finney's remarks. I think the points he made regarding the possibility of quarks for environmental cases was well made. And I think that that, that is something that would be of, of uh, real interest. Clearly, in environmental cases where communities are looking uh, for, for redress, the cost can be prohibitive. And I think if those, these principles could be extended in these cases, I think that's uh, very much worth uh, looking at. So, in conclusion, uh, these measures are welcome. I think they make a, 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 a positive step forward. We must ensure that the law is accessible and open to all. This is a, but one step, and I think, as Ben McPherson uh, made in his comments, we must continually re re review the law and how it works and seek to improve it, whether it's about the specifics or in general. I would ask that the government uh, commits to excluding trade unions from Section 10. I know that they said that they will look on, on, on amendments sympathetically, but I would welcome a further and more robust uh, commitment to that. And I think finally, it is vital that we do have a commitment to a five-year review of this legislation as a whole. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I call on uh, Gordon Lindhurst, of course, for Conservatives. Six minutes, please, Mr Lindhurst. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would begin my speech by mentioning my register of interests as a practicing advocate, a member of the Faculty of Advocates. And uh, perhaps I might uh, simply provide an anecdote on this and mention a mythical creature who has hardly featured in this debate except in the Minister's speech, and that is the Auditor of the Court of Session. Now, I don't know if anyone else, as I have, has appeared before the Auditor of the Court of Session. But uh, the auditor, of course, is someone who has a long history uh, created by act of sedarent of the Lords of Council in session in 1806 and confirmed by act of Parliament in 1821. And I see and I, I note the minister's comments and I'm pleased to see that she confirms the auditor will remain independent of the Scottish ministers. And I do have uh, one or two points I would like to raise with her just on that briefly. Uh, when I appeared before the auditor of the court of session, because the auditor can determine whether fees are fair or reasonable, uh, I, I had acted in a case a number of years ago, so it wasn't the current auditor, but rather one of his predecessors, and the solicitor who had questioned the level of the fee that I had charged on the basis it was too much. I had myself thought it was reasonable. We went into a room, the auditor sat on one side of the table, uh, I explained to the auditor why I thought the fee was appropriate in detail, and the solicitor explained in detail why he thought it was not. And then the auditor basically made a decision, as a judge does in a court case, on that. And the solicitor and I, it was a very professional um, hearing. It didn't interfere with our relationship as professionals. However, the, I should say that the confidence in the process or the Office of Auditor of the Court of Session, I think is 
probably not in question, and certainly my confidence in it was boosted by the outcome of that, uh, when, to my surprise, the auditor's decision arrived, and although I had not asked for this, he decided my fee was too low and increased it. <laughs> now, I, I don't know if it was for that reason that uh, I never had to appear in front of, of him again, but uh, I should, uh, of course, add to that that solicitors and I would on occasion discuss fees because that's normally how one would adjust fees. So the, in section 13, my question really to the minister, and she may want to um, give reassurances on this, section 13.4, uh, talking about the appointment of an auditor of court, it is said that the appointment a lasts for such period and B is on such other terms and conditions as the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service may determine. Now, my concern about that is, A, will we continue to have, as we have had in the last 13 auditors, uh, someone who is legally qualified and entitled to litigate in the courts themselves and therefore in a position to judge these matters properly and fairly and appropriately, and the second is the question of, because it is a sort of quasi-judicial office that the auditor holds, and I'm pleased to see in the Act, the auditor's functions for the whole of Scotland uh, in terms of the auditing of court fees and that is retained. The length of tenure, because that doesn't seem to be spelt out, and indeed the security of conditions of the office. I wonder if the minister might give us some assurance on that, because it is a, an office which is an integral part of ensuring that the matter which we have before the Parliament today will be properly um, carried out. Now, I think most of the points have been covered in this uh, fairly consensual debate on the purpose of this legislation, the primary purpose, which is said to be to resolve disparity between the position of pursuer and defender, in particular in personal injuries litigations. And the question, as always, a bit like in a court of law, there's been evidence about the fear of swinging ex expenses awards, uh, but at my understanding from the committee's report is that the evidence was not entirely clear on this, but the committee has clearly come to a view on the value of the proposals uh, based on, in particular, Sheriff Principal Taylor's view that was the fear of adverse awards of costs inhibit people from exercising their legal rights. And I think it's right that we should bear in mind the other side of the coin, and I know that this has been addressed by members of the committee, uh, such as Rona Mackay and Fulton McGregor, that we should avoid in Scotland creating the sort of compensation culture that we do see in some other jurisdictions and is not necessarily of benefit to those who have valid claims. And I do wonder about the test in terms of the one-way cost shifting being based on Wednesbury and reasonableness because uh, fraud, of course, would be a very high standard to apply, but Wednesbury uh, unreasonableness is equally hard if uh, one does, as I have, tried to argue that before a judge in the specifics of a case. So I think it might be helpful to have a bit more clarity on that particular test. Uh, I do welcome that the committee has proposed the government look at extending mandatory pre-action protocol for personal injuries claims and also that, as Daniel Johnson called for, and I think Margaret Mitchell touched on this for the committee, that uh, there does need to be consideration and definite proposals for post-legislative scrutiny. So I'd simply close by saying that uh, we need to look at this very carefully because as Liam Care referred to David against Goliath cases. Some of these are simply David against David cases or indeed Goliath against Goliath cases. Thank you. Thank you. Before I call you, Minister, can I just say uh, that we will be moving shortly on to the next debate. I do not see any French bench members or any speakers in the next debate here. I hope they're paying attention for wherever they are because in eight minutes they better be on their feet. I now call the Minister. Minister for the Government, eight minutes, please. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. And just uh, for the, because it's not clear if it's on the record, I would uh, point members to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein you will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I do hold a current practicing certificate, albeit I'm not practicing. 
Presiding officer, I've listened with great interest uh, to the debate this afternoon and indeed the contributions uh, from uh, across the chamber. And I do welcome very much the general support expressed for the bill. Uh, although I do uh, appreciate that some members have uh, concerns on some issues. I think it would be helpful to uh, stress at the outset of my closing remarks what the fundamental aspiration of this bill is, and that is uh, to ensure that those contemplating litigation in our civil courts should have more certainty about what it will cost them so that there is predictability as to cost, there are increased funding options, and of course uh, that we seek to uh, address the inequality of arms and personal injury uh, uh, cases and that in turn will afford uh, increased access to justice which I am pleased to hear all members uh, support. Uh, in general, presiding officer, the bill has received broad support not only uh, from stakeholders rep representing pursuers but also stakeholders representing uh, and defenders. Uh, and I would like to turn to some of the issues raised in the time I have available. Obviously that is uh, now about seven minutes so I don't know if I'll be able to deal with every single issue but I'll certainly do my best to deal with the section 10 issue. Um, I, I, I had made it clear in committee, and I thought I made it clear again uh, in today's uh, opening statement, that we absolutely do not intend to cover, to encompass within that uh, obligation, trades unions. And we will reflect, and the parliamentary draftsmen will reflect very carefully. They, I think, take the view that actually it's clear at the moment, but I do recognise the concerns raised, and I do undertake absolutely to make sure that we make it absolutely clear that trade unions are not covered, nor legal services providers. On the important issue of future loss element of damages, that was raised by a number uh, of members this afternoon. And of course, the Justice Committee has asked us to have another think uh, about this. Uh, uh, and I think it's important to remember that Chair Principal Taylor made a very detailed and careful consideration of this issue in his recommendations, in his report, and uh, that in relation to the future element of damages uh, and whether the future element was to be paid by way of periodical payment order or uh, by way of a lump sum uh, payment. In fact, uh, as regards periodical payment orders, these are currently a matter of practice in our courts, albeit that the court uh, can't impose a PPO without the consent of the parties. We propose to bring legislation forward uh, this year to amend that. But of course, periodical payment orders can currently uh, and are in fact imposed. And uh, the future element of damages, therefore, to the extent that they will be uh, dealt with by way of a PPO are already ring-fenced under the proposals in this bill because they may not, if there is a PPO, be included in any success fee calculation. Uh, and indeed it is in these circumstances where a PPO is made that we do tend to see these cases where you do need to address the longer term care needs of the individual uh, pursuer uh, concerned. Chair Principal Taylor concluded that any future loss which is to be compensated rather by a lump sum should not, however, be excluded per se from the ambit of a damages-based agreement and the calculation of the success fee under that agreement. He said, and I quote, this has the considerable advantage of simplicity. And he made that conclusion on the basis that therefore the, it would not involve agreeing how a principal sum of lump sum damages should be divided as between past and future loss and indeed remarked that there was a real risk of incentivizing delay in the proceedings such that people would seek to attribute uh, more to past loss than to future uh, loss. He also argued that requiring parties to stipulate how an agreed lump sum settlement figure should be divided into different heads of loss could be impractical and could pose a barrier to settlement and that he indicated that protection for the pursuer could be achieved by other means. And these are set out in the bill, such that at section 6.5 and subsection 6, there is provision for independent assessment uh, in circumstances where the lump sum exceeds £1 million of whether it is in the best interest of the pursuer to have the future element paid by a periodical payment order or lump sum. If the damages are awarded by a court, then this will be assessed by the court. If the damages are to be agreed uh, by a settlement, then the question will be referred to an actuary. The bill has faithfully followed Chair of Principal Taylor's recommendations in this regard. Uh, and the Scottish uh, Government uh, uh, taking that into account and also Chair of Principal Taylor's very comprehensive evidence on this particular issue before the Justice Committee is not persuaded that there is a need to change uh, its policy on uh, this matter. Reference has been made to what happens in England and Wales but also reference was made to, by Chair of Principal Taylor to the fact that uh, him, in, as, in his view uh, Lord Justice Jackson, who had taken a different view in his uh, work, had got, in fact, cold feet uh, further to uh, making his conclusions some years ago. It's also important to point out that the amount, the percentage of the claim is on a sliding scale. So at the moment, for example, a claim of £1 million, 
uh, if it was a, a, a fee of 15%, that would be on the entire amount. So that would be uh, uh, £150,000. If, uh, under the sliding scale cap, this proposal is accepted by the Parliament, that then will be a claim of a damages a fee, success fee of £72,500. So it is important to, to bear that in mind. On the issue of qualified one-way cost shifting, I do welcome the conclusion of the Justice Committee that the introduction of qualified one-way cost shifting will improve access uh, to justice. Uh, I do not accept, and nor does uh, some key parts of the evidence accept, that this will lead to a rise in unmeritorious uh, uh, claims. Uh, and indeed, there will be a number of factors which would mitigate against that. Uh, these include um, the fact that why would you, as a solicitor, take on a case if you, there's no chance of success, you don't get paid, you use up your time, you spend money in outlays that you can't uh, recover. Uh, secondly, the regulation of claims management companies in Scotland will discourage unscrupulous claims management companies operating north of the border. Uh, third, uh, the compulsory... Uh, I, yes, I will here. Liam Kerr. Just very briefly, does that mean, therefore, that uh, the Minister would uh, agree that we should wait for the regulation of claims management companies before bringing this bill in? Uh, Minister. I'm going to get on to that, but obviously time's short. Uh, uh, no, because I, I think it is the case, firstly, that if there is to be a gap, it will be of a very short order. Secondly, uh, it is to be remembered that many claims management companies already operate subject to uh, their, uh, uh, an entity that is already regulated, be it in terms of their solicitor ownership, be it in terms of the MOJ, uh, and also it is clear that this is the direction of travel in Scotland. So uh, the message is out there for any uh, claims management company that wished to operate in, in a way that it was inconsistent with this legislation, that in very short order, uh, this legislation, if passed by this parliament, would uh, apply uh, to it. Uh, and also it is the case uh, in regard to the, the, the unlikelihood of a huge surge in unmeritorious claims. Uh, that the, the bill itself uh, provides in section 8.4 uh, for circumstances in where, uh, where the uh, benefit of qualified one-way cost shifting may be uh, lost. And I do understand and hear the comments made about section 8.4 and we are uh, looking at that. But I would say in terms of the uh, uh, issue raised about possible increases in insurance premiums, that on the basis that uh, it is not founded that there will be an automatic rise in uh, spurious claims, I do not see therefore that the consequential conclusion that there will be this significant rise in insurance premiums is founded uh, either. Presiding officer, I see that I am uh, quickly uh, running out of uh, time, uh, but I do thank very much the work of the uh, Justice uh, Committee, uh, and uh, I look forward to further discussion on all these matters at stage two. Uh, there were a number of issues that I just did not get time to deal with today, but I'm always happy to speak to members uh, about particular issues of concern that they have. Uh, uh, and uh, I would uh, thank uh, the uh, members for their support in principle of this bill, uh, and I commend the uh, motion in my name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on the Civil Litigation Expenses in Group Proceedings Scotland Bill at Stage 1. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. I'll suspend briefly uh, to allow the front benches to take their places. I apologise to Ms Hislop, who was actually in the chamber when I made my comments. And Mr Carlo, who's looking a bit peeved.